It's so big, it, it, it's really hard to keep tidy. Yeah. It's like. But you always have pretty organised, I think it would be fun. Oh, gosh, she keeps us organised, yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> if it wasn't for her, it would fall apart. <laughs> she was like, I'm managing this from a distance today. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Second ago, mm -hmm. and my connection was as well. Oh, okay. As soon as uh, go back on here, it should be okay. I wonder if we just have a little Wi Fi in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And so after the service today, like we do every fortnight, we'll be having brunch. Please uh, stay with us and join us for brunch today. It's always a special time as a church to um, eat together. And so um, if you're new or visiting to church, you've come midway into a series called Hope in a Hostile World. We're working our way through the book of Daniel. The last six weeks we've been looking at the first six chapters of... Should I get my words today? <laughs> Less coffee, more water. Um, we've been looking at the first six chapters of Daniel and just been amazed at the storyline that's happening there. There's, there's quite a change in uh, chapter 7, which will, Ray will open up for us today. Quite a change. We, we move into to some dreamy vision kind of language. But we're looking forward to progressing our way through uh, Daniel. As a way of getting our hearts right, let's pray together now. Uh, prayer will appear on the screen. Pray it with me together. Gracious, Gracious God, God, we humbly thank, thank you for all your gifts so freely given to us. For life and health and safety, for the power to work, leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But, above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your Spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace of the through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Alright kids, come on up the front if you're not here already. It's time for a kid spot. I'm going to invite Kiralee up. Thanks Kiralee, thanks kids.
kids cheerleading. Thanks, kids. Good to see the kids at uh, brunch time, morning tea time and brunch time. Uh, as I said earlier, please uh, come and stay for brunch with us. We'd love to get to know you better. We'd love to keep growing as a community and as a family. Some other things to let you know about. As Kiralee just said, next school holidays, the second week of the September school holidays, Right here, our church will be transformed 27th to the 29th of September for those three days, Wednesday through Friday. Uh, a huge um, kids club for those three days. Kids holiday club we will be happening right here. It's a, it's a treasure thing, pirate's treasure. It's going to be a lot of fun. They're going to learn some great truths like we just sang there about following Jesus across those three days. In the foyer, we have flyers. We have... Um, a way to distribute invites to your neighbours, to your unit blocks, to your street. There's a bunch of flyers right down the street. Let us uh, let us know where you're going to send your flyers to. If people are wanting to know, there's, um, there's paper copies of Rego forms. They can also register online. I right hear we've got seven Regos to date. We're hoping to get a whole lot more between now and the September school holidays. But um, we're really happy with that. It's um, going to be a special time for us as a church. Following brunch, Kerry is having a meeting for those that are able to help uh, with Kids Holiday Club to hear some more and um, get everything organised and ready for that. The women of RPAC have a dessert night coming up. Ladies, if you'd like to get to know other women at RPAC and grow in your friendship with them, this will be a great opportunity uh, at Ali Hushkel's place, Friday, September 8th, uh, 7 o'clock. You can let her know about that if you're able to come or let someone else know if you're able to come. That's coming up um, really soon. Some final things to say just quickly. In the foyer at the moment is some information to collect. You know, there's a very uh, special and important refer referendum coming up in this country, a voice to parliament, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders uh, in our country. Uh, a voice referendum is being put to the vote very soon. We'll hear about that soon. Um, it's an important thing, an important thing to consider, to read about, to talk about, to pray about. There's some great information and resources that have been offered to us as a church uh, that explore both sides, the yes and the no, really considered well-written articles there in the foyer. If you want to take a copy of those home, just on this side of the foyer on the table, grab um, some info there. I sent out a bu bu bunch of info during the week on the email. Um, with links and things. If you're not getting the church emails yet and you'd like to get information like that on a regular basis, <coughs> let us know. Fill out one of our connect cards in the foyer and we'll get you on our um, email list. All right, that's enough announcements for now. We're going to sing again. I'm going to invite the band up. After we see one of our Bible readings and then Ray will come and speak to us from Dan the city. Sing a song that we haven't done for a while, or maybe ever. I don't know. I just kind of stretch, so I thought it'd be um, important to think about when I'm thinking about men's dreams and um, yeah, everything that he's sort of uh, prophesied um, about the New Testament. So, please stand and sing, see him coming. Um, fairly easy to get here. <laughs>
inclusion of a ram and a goat. Uh, in the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. In my... One before. That's next week. Oh, you know what? I... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> vision at night I looked and there before me was one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All people, nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that had passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the true meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth, but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and the most terrifying with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up, before which three of them fell, the horn that looked more imposing than the others, that had eyes and a mouth and spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until 
until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favour of the saints of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the most high and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, <coughs> and half a time. But the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, <coughs> the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Have a read the Chinese version. Daniel,你说七章一到二十八节，巴比伦王说杀杀元年，巴尼里在床上做梦，见了脑中的异象。就记录这梦又有一兽如熊有大铁牙吞吃嚼碎他的衣服洁白如水见那兽衣硬小脚他的权柄是永远的那时我愿知道第四兽的真情
这脚有眼，有说夸大的火，形状长横，过于他的同类。我观看，见这脚与圣婴正站，生了苍蝇，直到滚滚常在者，来给知道者的圣名伸冤。圣名得国的时候就到了。那施利者这样说。第四兽就是世上必有的第四国，与一切国大不相同，必吞吃全地，连剪擦的着睡。至第四着，就是这国中必兴起的十王，后来又兴起了一王，与先前的不同，他必吃服三皇，他必向至高者说夸大的话，必折磨至高者的声音，必想改变节期和律法，圣民必交付于他手，不再、两再、半载。然而审判者必做刑判，他的权柄必被夺去、毁坏、灭灭绝，一致到底。国度、权柄和千山诸国的大权，必赐给至高者的圣民。他的国是永远的，一切转权的都必侍奉他、顺从他。至那世之子完毕，至于我但以你中心中盛世金黄，脸色也改变了，却将内事存记在心。圣经都比
in ancient thinking was a place of turmoil and trouble and strife. That's why it's really interesting when you get to Jesus in the New Testament, one of the most spectacular things he does is on this sea, probably the very same sea, no, a different one, on this sea, Jesus stands up in a boat and in the middle of a huge storm, when the sea was raging, Jesus says, stop. And it stops. Because in ancient thinking and in New Testament thinking, the one who controlled the sea was amazing. And Jesus just showed that he was the one who controlled the sea. Anyway, these, these beasts came out of the sea. There was a lion with wings. And it had its wings stripped off it. That tends people to say, maybe it's Nebuchadnezzar that it's talking about there in Babylon. Then there was a bear with ribs. And people say, maybe, maybe this was media and, and Persia. There was a leopard with four heads and wings. Now, a leopard moves really quickly. And because the Greeks took over the world very, very quickly, they say, maybe, maybe this is the Greek empire that they're talking about here. And, and then there was a fourth kingdom, which was absolutely huge. And, of course, people say that was the Roman kingdom. Now, there's debates about it. People say, no, no that, that's, they're not the right labels. And it's referring to the end times anyway. We're not referring to specific things that happened then. But it can refer to specific things that happened then. It looks pretty accurate in some ways. <coughs> that's not what this is about. Don't get overly concerned with the details. And don't be one of these people that, that, that talk, talks about these dreams endlessly because that's not the point of what, what is happening here in this chapter. The other thing that we see is a godly throne room. All the things of God and God himself and the godly counsel and the angels meet. And that's very important. Um, and the godly throne room has one person in it called the Son of Man. And he's going to become very important. He's the vice regent. And we'll talk about him a little bit later. And this vice regent, this son of man, brings to an end the reign of these various kingdoms. But as I said, it's not important to know the details, but it is important to know some things. So what is it important to know? What we learn from this chapter that's really important and really, and the rubber really hits the road when it, when it, when it comes to us. Well, first of all, God causes these kingdoms, these vicious kingdoms, which increase in ferocity and which challenge God, God calls, causes these kingdoms to exist. How do I know that? And how does Daniel know that? Well, if you look in Hosea, Hosea was a prophet before Daniel, and he was warning the people of Israel that they should change. If they don't change, they're going to be put in captivity. And Hosea, in chapter 13, verses 7 to 8, you can look it up when you get home, uses exactly the same beasts when he's talking about the beasts that will come forward and take over the world. Now, that's really interesting. But then, the very important fact is that Hosea says, and the reason why God causes these people to come is because you, Israel, have turned against God and he's giving you a wake-up call. Daniel understood that whatever kingdom came along, it was put there by God. And it was put there by the kingdom of God. It just didn't happen. God wasn't sitting on the sidelines, biting his fingernails and saying, what have I done? Oh, sorry, people, things got a bit out of hand. I didn't think it was going to be this bad. No, God was directing events, and you know what? I think he was directing events with tears in his eyes for his own people, and tears in his eyes for the beasts who were causing it to happen. God was causing it, but it distressed him. The second thing that's really important is the throne room, that description of the council of God. The godly people all meeting together. And the throne room was where the power and the rule of God over the entire creation is revealed. This is a picture of the creator meeting with this powerful council which rules creation. And the books are open. And what that means is 
Judgment is going to come. The books being open always indicates judgment. So these godly, this godly council meets and the people of all these other kingdoms who are opposing God better be afraid because God says, now you're going to be judged. So the books are open and things are put right. When the godly council meets and the books are open, folks, I've got to say to you, this will be a time in the history of the entire cosmos, not just the earth, but the entire creation, when all that is sad gives way to peace and joy. Set the light again, when all that is sad about the world that we live in and the creation that we exist in will give way to peace and joy because of this throne and because of this godly, powerful council. In that council, and this is just spectacular, in that council comes one like a son of man. How important is this to One like a son of man. <coughs> Basically, it's saying, comes one who is a human. But this is a proper human. In the image of God, not a beast like all these other that arise, not an animal, not someone who has given away the image of God and lost their humanity. You know, when someone acts in a way that's so wicked, we can find no other way to describe it sometimes than to say you're behaving like an animal. You've lost your humanity. You're behaving like an animal. And so these people that set up these kingdoms in opposition to God were behaving like animals as far as God was concerned. And along comes the real human being that Martin Luther called Jesus the proper man. So this is the son of man, the proper man, with all the dignity and image of God attached to him. This person is a cloud rider. Now what do I mean by that? Well, the vision of God in the Bible is often accompanied by clouds. And the one arriving on clouds is the one with all authority. Now, in the Old Testament, the only one that had that cloud rider of authority, the one that was in charge, was Jehovah, God himself. And then God says, but now I have a vice regent. Let me introduce him to you. He looks like a human, but he's actually a cloud rider. In other words, God is saying, this is me. This is Yahweh. This is Jehovah in a different form. Can you believe that occurred so early in the Old Testament, that notion? And it did. This person has authority over all creation and will introduce God's kingdom, the preeminent kingdom in the history. This notion was so spectacular that it paved the way for Jewish people who were avid monotheists. They believed in one God. It paved the way for Jewish people to understand the one God concept, but three distinct persons. It was the start of that notion for them. And it prepares us for the teaching of the New Testament about Jesus. Very important. Now, given that this ancient dream which says God causes the stuff that happens on earth, which says that there's a godly throne room, which says that there's one like, one like a son of man, how are we to live and respond to what was in that dream? Because we don't believe we respond to what was in that dream. Well, this is where my title comes in, Me, Myself, and This is the first thing. There is no doubt that human beings are completely self-absorbed most of the time. Um, the selfie was unanimously voted in 2013 by Oxford, Diction Oxford Dictionaries, Word of the Year. So, selfie was voted Word of the Year in 2013. I think that's totally sad. <laughs> Completely sad. But, that's what it is. This ancient dream that Daniel had forces us to look up and take the eyes off ourselves and realise that we, in this small, insignificant church in Littleton Street at Riverwood, 
are in a truly cosmic battle. What we're doing when we meet here on Sunday mornings is a big cosmic deal. It has effect on the whole of creation. It's important, and the Council of Heaven says it's important, and it's looking at us, and it's watching what we're doing. And we need to be aware of that. Let me give some examples that sort of support that idea. Luke chapter 10. Uh, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out 72 disciples to go and tell people about the kingdom of God and what it means. In other words, talk to them about the gospel. And they come back, the, the, the disciples come back really excited and said, Jesus, you'd be amazed. It was fantastic. We did so well. And people listened to us. And people were stunned when we did things in your name. And you'd expect Jesus to say, well done, guys. We'll see more next time. This is fantastic. This is exactly what it would be. But he didn't. Jesus turned to them and said, when you did this, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. Isn't that amazing? Jesus turned around and said, what you did has had a huge cosmic effect. You thought you were just running around with your grubby sandals in Palestine <coughs> to the kingdom of God. No, you weren't. You were changing the history of the cosmos. It was really important, Jesus said. Furthermore, when Jesus was talking about um, the lost sheep, nine of them managed to get where they were supposed to go, and one didn't, and, and, and the shepherd went to all sorts of trouble to get the other sheep back and save it. And in Matthew 18, uh, 10 to 14, where, where that is, God says there is more rejoicing in heaven over that one lost sheep than all the other lost. More rejoicing in heaven. The council of heaven is really excited that the shepherd went and got that one sheep. It's like saying this church has been set up since it was formed and maybe there will be only one person that ever comes to the name of Jesus. Jared's hoping for a few more than that and so are we. But if it was and it was set up and only one person came to know Jesus, God would say, there's rejoicing in heaven over that. It's fantastic. We would say to God, it's only my lost sheep, but God says, I know. Isn't it fantastic? My kingdom is growing. My kingdom is growing. <coughs> so the point of this is, and the point of this dream is, we need to get a kick in the backside and realise that we're involved in a cosmic process. And when we fail, the council of heaven weeps for us. Be concerned. And when we succeed, the council of heaven cheers for us. Because we're getting it right. And we're building the kingdom of heaven. Now, um, the council of heaven and God would say to us, hang on, hang on people. The best is yet to come. We literally are really a part of the dream team. I'm almost sorry I said that. But we are we're almost part of the dream team. The second thing we need to learn from this, this story, uh, this true vision that Daniel had, is the inevitability of suffering. Tim Keller says that suffering is part of the warped and weft of creation. And I had to do it to my wife who knows about things then and said to me to walk and the web is the way the fibers crisscross together to make the <coughs> So when Keller is saying that, that suffering is a walk of web, he's saying that suffering is an integral part of creation as we know it. We can't avoid it. It's part of the very fabric of life. So if you're thinking of living a suffering-free life, forget about it. It's not going to happen. If you've not suffered so far in this life, and I don't know anybody in this room that hasn't. But if you don't say so far in this life, just stay alive. It'll come. It will come. Now, the dream secret of Daniel is not to be restricted to that time about 600 to 100 years BC. The fact that the book of Revelation 
describes the same circumstances in the book of Revelation as the last book of the Bible. The fact that the last book of the Bible describes the same sort of scene and the same sort of vision means that persecution is going to go on and on and on and on and it's going to increase in ferocity because the end of Daniel's vision had this little horn who was so vicious with his cruelty against Christians. So we know that things are not going to get better in the sense that we think that the world will all come to a census and we'll all be wonderful human beings. It's not going to be like that. It's going to get harder and harder and harder and the suffering that we know is the country of life is going to increase and increase and increase. Now, it's inevitable. But before you race outside and slash your wrist, let me just say to you, come with me and just enjoy the hope that Daniel actually talks about. I want to finish with this. There's something about that name. There's something about that name, Son of Man. Daniel uses the title Son of Man to describe the vice regent of heaven, as I said, the one with all the authority to control and manage creation. It was by far, and I didn't realise this, but it was by far the favourite way in, Jesus, in which Jesus referred to himself. He called himself the Son of Man. He said he was a good shepherd, he was a messiah, lots of other things, and a king. But he called himself the son of man 30 times in Matthew, and my wife has called me that he did it 81 times in the New Testament. Referred to himself as the son of man. Um, now, before the Sanhedrin, which was the council that Jesus appeared before, before he was crucified, he used it in this way. He said, in the future, he says to those who were trying him for blasphemy because he said he was God. In the future, he said, you will see the Son of Man, and straight away they thought of this powerful person from Daniel 3, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand, the position of authority of the Mighty One, and coming on the clouds of heaven. In other words, Jesus said, I'm the Son of Man, I'm in the position of authority, I'm running the world, in fact, I am God. You can imagine the effect that that had. That kind of extravagant talk would get you killed. And it did in Jesus' case. But of course, the Son of Man is God himself. And you can't kill him. He reversed death. And in so doing, he instituted a new kingdom, a new and powerful kingdom, of which we are a part we are a part of it. And he and the whole council of heaven walks with us to the end of history and beyond history. Now that's a game-changing trouble. As you experience life, when you experience these troubles, realise that the whole council of heaven, the Son of Man and his spirit walks with us to the end of history and beyond it. People who don't have that hope, it staggers me how they came through the world as it is. And you'd have to be the most blind optimist in the world to say, oh, it's getting better. No, it's not. So, keep the vision. Let me pray. Dear God, we, we thank you for this vision. Amy. We thank you that you are a wonderful God and a creator and a controller of all things that you create. We thank you that you care about us in a personal and loving way. And we thank you that no matter what happens, you are with us, you know what we're doing, and you have our best interests at heart. Help us never to forget that. Amen. Amen. <coughs>